Welcome back to our study on the book of Romans. This is Sonship Establishment, and this is session 20. Those verses that I was telling you about, if you'll just look there real quickly, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18, Paul says, Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. And then turn the page to chapter 3 and look at verse 10. Night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. That's the verse that I was looking for a while ago. 1 Thessalonians 3.10. So he was going to perfect that which was lacking in their faith. That's not their salvation faith. That's the doctrine that they're believing to operate out of. Now, uh, we, we, we were looking at James, and he was talking about, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted of evil, neither tempteth he any man. That will make somebody come along and say, What about all those times that the Bible says that God tempted so-and-so, if God doesn't tempt anybody. Well, let's take a look at that. One of those that you would have in mind would be Genesis 22. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. The rest of it's not important. There's two different tempt... The word is being used in two different ways. When it says in James, God doesn't tempt people with evil, it's saying He doesn't tempt them to commit sin. This is not saying God tempted Abraham to commit sin. God doesn't do that. He tempted Abraham in what? He did what? Not tempted, give me the other word. Tested. Yeah, He tried him. He tested him. He, you know, and He was trying his, fa his faith. That's what He's doing here. And Abraham did what? Believed God. Remember? And all that was counted to... Uh, okay, now... Go back to, uh, take you back to James, and he says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. All of this, remember how we got here. I was showing you the verse in Corinthians that said, You will not be tempted above that which you are able. That wasn't a temptation to sin. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. You're not talking about tempting them to commit sin. This is the testing of their faith, the trying of their faith. And by the way, when he says the trying of your faith worketh patience, they're being treated as sons. Does that ring a bell with you from anything you've been through in the book of Romans? Yeah. Remember what, what Paul said in, uh, in, well, I thought I had it up there and I guess I didn't. But Paul said in Romans, and tribulation worketh patience and patience endureth. And remember that? Yeah. Same kind of deal. All right, now. James 1.14 tells you, if you're talking about sinning, that's not a work of the devil, it's not a work of God. But every man is tempted in this way when he is drawn away of his own, his own lust and enticed. Sin is a work of the flesh. The Satan's not interested in that. I know that as Christians, here's what we think. I just need to get saved. And now the whole rest of my life is about not sinning. I'm not saying that, that it shouldn't matter to you. I'm not trying to give anybody the green light on just go do whatever you want to do. God doesn't care. What I'm trying to say is there's more to it than that. And, and it's not just a... And so the, the, Satan knows the sin issue is going to be your own flesh. You're going to have to control that. That's what that first two parts of your sanctification were about. And so... Anyway, with that being, with that being said, th those, those guys, by the way, that he says the trying of your faith, you know, well, let me back up. He's not saying you're, you're being tempted to sin. This was them holding fast to what they had learned. Okay, now, Matthew 4, you remember this is the other issue with tempter. And I'm going to show you some very interesting things here. This, then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil... And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. He's coming to tempt Jesus. He's not asking him to commit a sin. In fact, he's asking Jesus to do something that's very biblical. And I do want to talk about that. But I want to show you that there is... This, by the way, the issue is, if thou be the Son of God, it's His Sonship that's in focus here. What is about to be tried is Jesus as the Son. That's what's uh, uh, under consideration. Look in Mark, chapter 1, verse 11. 
And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And immediately the Spirit drives them into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beast, and the angels ministered unto him. When you read that, you get a little different idea about the temptation. What does that verse tend to make you think about his temptation? Oh, oh, okay, but I, I'm, I'm looking, at, looking at verse 13. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan. What impression does that give you? Satan was trying to get him off track from being a son. That, that's true. Satan was trying to get him off track from being a son. I'm try, well, let me ask you this way then. How many times was Jesus tempted? Be careful. Twice. Now how many temptations did Jesus endure? Let's say it that way. Lots. Why do you say lots? Because it says in, 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 until later when he came back. When the angels ministered to him. And then back. Okay. How long was he tempted? All his own life. Well, right here in this passage. This tempta oh, 40 days. He was tempted for 40 days. The temptations that get shown to you, command these stones to be made bread, go into the pinnacle of the temple, bow down and worship me, give you kings of this world, happen after the 40 days. The 40 days were full of trials. It's not just those three, or when you think of the two, the six, it's 40 days of trials. And then the only ones you're told specifically about are the ones that happen after the 40 days is over. Let me, let me just show you. Luke 4. Let's just go to Luke and look at it. And Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness being 40 days tempted of the devil. That's the point I was trying to get you to. He's tempted the whole 40 days. The idea that Jesus is just hanging out for 40 days not eating and then he gets uh, some temptations is not the case. But this is, this is going on uh, the whole 40 days that he's out there. Now, in one account, I want you to notice if I can get, take you back to Matthew 4. See, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights and he was afterward and hungered, after the 40 days and 40 nights, then the tempter comes to him and says, command these stones to be made bread. That's not the only temptation. He's already had 40 days of it. Now there's another difference in here. As a matter of fact, people look at these two accounts and they say, you know what, there's some differences in these accounts and so that's a contradiction in the Bible. But what you already know is there's actually two accounts of Jesus being tempted. There's two different sets of temptations that follow the 40 days of fasting. And, and, and as we look at this, I want you to see, and in fact, let me just take you this next, I'm sorry. In fact, I guess I'm going to have to back up to show you this. Let me just make sure that I'm not going to have, no, I'm going to have to back up to show it to you. Let me back up to Matthew 4. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness. Do you see that? Take a look at Mark, verse 12. And immediately the Spirit, what? Drive. Driveth him into the wilderness. There's actually ten differences between the two accounts. One of them, he's led into the wilderness. The other one, the Spirit drives him into the wilderness. The one, another one that's really interesting is, I want you to notice where it says... Um, if I can get it here, uh, let's see. If, let, let me go back. Look at this. Matthew 4. If thou be the Son of God, command what? These stones. These stones be made bread. But when you get to Luke, oh man, I didn't, I didn't put it in there. I can't believe that. Look at Luke 4. I should I can't believe I didn't include that in the PowerPoint. I sure meant to. Luke chapter 4. And what are we at here? Verse 1. Um, 
Look at verse 3. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command what? This stone, singular or plural? Singular. But what is it in Matthew? Command that these stones. There's one of those differences that takes place between these two. And there's a reason that that's slightly different. Now what I'm really trying to get you to is that Jesus in this temptation, why is there only three of these that are mentioned? Because they cover every point in which a temptation can come. In other words, those three represent the three sources from which every temptation comes. Look at 1 John 2.16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, there's one, the lust of the eyes is two, and the pride of life is three. It's not of the Father, but of this world. There's the three categories from which all of those things come. And Jesus suffered all of those. That's why Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says, "For we, this is to the remnant, not us. He says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeding of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are. Someone reads that and says, Oh, no, he wasn't. Jesus wasn't tempted to commit this sin and that sin and this sin. It didn't say that. It said in all points tempted, and there's only three of them. And he was tempted in all three. And you have a record of that sitting over in Matthew 4 and in Mark 4. You get all of those. And that's why Hebrews 2 says, For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able also to succor them that are tempted. When, when he says that, he's saying this. He suffered being tempted. That tempted was not tempted to sin, but tempted to... He was being tried. He was being tested. Your faith is going to be tested too. Your faith is going to be tried too. And if He suffered that to happen, guess what? We're going to suffer that to happen. And as Pam was talking about earlier, we're going to suffer with Him. And that doesn't always mean... the the pain and anguish of a suffering, but suffering that we're going to allow some things to take place. Remember? Suffer it to be so, to fulfill all righteousness. Suffer the little children to come unto me. He's not talking about they give me a headache. He's talking about allow it. And that's what's being done here. He allowed that to happen. We're going to have to allow that to happen. So Jesus has tried for 40 days in the wilderness. He is tempted in every point that a man can be tempted in, and he suffered it to be so. That's the same way it's going to be for us. And that takes you back to James 1, 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And here's that bell it ought to have rung with you, Romans 5. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Okay, just, just getting to that. Now... Those, and you know what? I did have those on the PowerPoint. There's the stones. And then in... in is that rain? Somebody's window? Is your window down, Bob? Somebody give Norma a life jacket. Huh? It's a sign, and Randall says it's a sign. It's a sign you better roll them windows up. That's the truth. It's over. Or, well, she went to the door. <laughs> if she'll come back and sit down, they'll crank up again. All right. So I did have these up. I just didn't realize that I had to turn there, and that was a little premature. Okay. Now, by the way, just to sum this up, what are these two about? And, and, and I'm going to let you just look at your notes to get the details of this because we need to move on with it. But one of these is qualifying him... In Matthew, do you remember there's a genealogy sitting in Matthew? If you, look, if you look back at that genealogy that's sitting in Matthew, you just go back. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ and the first son, it says, the son of David. And that means the temptation that is recorded in Matthew... Jesus is qualifying to operate as the Redeemer as the son of David. In Luke, 
it goes all the way, the genealogy goes all the way back to who? Adam. To Adam. And that means that the trial in Luke 4 is he is being tested as the Son of Man. What is the two differences there? We're talking about his redemption. What's the difference between being the Son of David and the Son of Man? No. No, he is both man and deity, but that's not what this is. As the son of David, what is that about? Think, just think. What is the son of David about? Oh, it's such a Okay. You know, I know you think <laughs> this can't be a wrong answer. Oh, okay. Yes, the Jewish nation. Yeah. It, 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 he, he's going to come and redeem the Jewish nation. That's him. This is about him being the Messiah. The Christ. What is the Son of Man about? Yeah, the, yeah, the, the whole world. He not only qualified through those temptations to redeem Israel, which the prophets was full of, He qualified to redeem the whole world. And a, and a, and a Redeemer has to qualify to do that. He did so. And, and that's what those two things are about. And, that, and those genealogies kind of point you back to that. I had a passage in here. I, I, the only thing I'll show you about it is, by the way, th th there's another difference. I didn't do it, but in, 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 in the listing of these, one of these says, in, in, in Matthew, I, this is the way it goes, turn the stones into bread, he takes him up to the pinnacle of the temple, and then he shows him the kingdoms of this world and says, if you'll bow down and worship me, I'll give you the kingdoms of this world. The second one has this. Command the stone be made bread. He shows him the kingdoms of this world. And then he takes him up to the pinnacle of the temple. And he swaps the last two around. And, and, and that's evident. You can, again, you can read the notes, but let me just take you to it. When, when, when you're looking at this, when Jesus was eight days old, his parents took him in to be uh, circumcised. And uh, according to the law, well, we'll just look. Verse 26. Uh, th this guy that well, I'm going to just I'm going to wind up telling you the whole thing. Uh, uh, there's a guy at the temple, and he's told you're not going to die before you see the Lord's Christ. And so they come in with Jesus when he's eight days old, and they're going to circumcise him at the end of verse 27 according to the custom of the law. And then he sees him, he takes him up in his arms, he blesses the Lord. Verse 29. Now I can die because I've seen what your word has talked about. Mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which I have prepared before the face of all people. Look at the first thing he mentions: a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. See the order of that. You got the Gentile, the kingdoms of this world. That's why they're in the order that they're in. Now you can go and you can look at that and, and you know, and I'll explain that in the notes and, you know, if you're interested. But that temple, people look at that and they think, by the way, these things all had, the stones be made bread speaks of the, of the provision, the miraculous provision. If you turn stones into bread, wouldn't that be a miracle? Well, that is the miraculous provision for the believing remnant out in the day of wrath who are going to be miraculously fed out there. Not just stones or bread. Manna is going to fall from heaven. Those kinds of things are going to happen. What's going to happen next? Look at this. The next thing is, the Lord will come suddenly to... Oh, we're going to read it. His temple. That's when He first comes back at the advent. And then guess what? Then He'll set up His kingdom. There's the other one. And that's why Malachi says, Behold, I send my messenger. He'll prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom you seek, shall suddenly come to His temple. Even the messenger of the covenant, whom you delight in. That's, that's the order of this one. And that's why you have two different orders there. I know I'm being sketchy about it, but what I'm trying to show you is if you knew what was sitting in the prophets, when you got over to those temptations in Matthew and in Luke, you wouldn't be looking at them like, oh, these contradict each other. You'd understand. One of them is qualifying him for the Jewish nation as the son of David. The other qualifies him as the redeemer of the world, as the son of man. You would see those genealogies. You'd remember what was in the prophets, and you'd have put all of that together. But we don't know that kind of stuff because we didn't get taught that kind of stuff. So, anyway, let's take this back now to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. There hath no temptation 
Give me another word now. Not temptation to sin, but what? Trial. No trial, no test taken you, but such as is common to man. For the Corinthians, he said, there's not anything happening to you guys that isn't happening to everybody. It's common to man. He says, but God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tested, tried, above that ye are able. Now you see that verse for what it is. It's not about temptation to sin. You're never going to be put to the test above that which you're able. And, and, that mean, and by the way, what is it that's going to make you able to, look, that you may be able to bear it? What's going to enable you to endure that trial? Yes, the sonship curriculum. Now you see, he said, and that means if you're just in sonship establishment, Satan has to leave you alone. But when he finally, when you do get to the place that you learn something, you're going to learn it before you ever get tested by it. And, and that testing will only be in accordance with where you are. That verse should bring you some comfort and cause you to know that I'm not going to have to endure, you know, who knows what coming my way. That's, remember, we all went back to that thing about where Paul said, who shall separate from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or so? Remember when he's doing that? That You say, I, I don't know how I'll go through that. You don't need to know that now. The only thing you need to know is that the, God has put it in the curriculum and when you get there, you'll never be tested in it before you get there. And when you get there, you'll be ready for it. Does that make sense? That's the kind of confidence you're supposed to have. Now, I hope that helps somebody because I can tell you now, I've already had someone say to me, I'm looking at things in that chapter as you had us read on down, and I'll be honest with you, some of that frightens me and I don't know if I can do it. Well, right now, you don't know how you would do that. You're looking at that and thinking, I just don't know what would happen if I went through that right now. And your father knows that, and that's why you won't go through that right now. And when you get to verse 39, you still won't know. The only thing you'll know is, when I get there, I'll be ready. That's the confidence. Now, I'm just trying to straighten that out. Do you know why that's important? Because if I don't make this distinction and we get to the end of verse 39, there would be people sitting in this room saying, I'm not there. Everybody else looks like they know, but I don't know. I tell you what, if that thing happened to me, I don't know what I'd do. That'd scare me to death. Maybe sonship doesn't work for me. And you know what I did? I just knocked them out of their sonship because I expected, I, I gave them the impression they were supposed to be further than they could be. I don't think we can force that on people when they haven't even been given it yet. That, does that make any sense? Okay, I just didn't want that to be a discouragement and cause somebody to drop out. I've heard those kinds of statements before. Well, it just didn't work. Well, that, you're kind of restating that thing right there in Corinthians. Okay. Now, that second question, taking it back to that second question, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? If you don't have that confidence, this, it, and this is the question, by the way, that is meant to put this issue to rest in your own mind, because if you don't, you're going to come along and ask, you're going to say to this, well, it works, sonship works for that person, but it doesn't work for me. And I'm going to ask you this, do you think your father spared not his own son, but delivered him up so that it wouldn't work for you? See, you have to look at this from the way it's been presented to you. The guarantee. How are you guaranteed it'll work for you? Because he spared not his own son. Yeah. I mean, you know, this is, this is how that works. Someone else would say, I have a situation in my life that keeps this from working for me. No, you don't. Because you can't... Okay, 
please do not underestimate the power of this curriculum. I could have taken you over to the book of Ephesians and shown you what he says over there about the power of this curriculum being the greatest power that God possesses and what it will do. I decline to put that in your notes because I think we'll just we'll see it when we get over there. But there is, and I did mention this to you, there is something that has been said that would limit the ability of this curriculum to do its job. That somehow you would fail, even though you've made the cry of Abba Father, even though you want it to work, there's a situation that you think that maybe this won't work for me and I'm not going to be successful as a son. And, I, and it's been said to me by lots of folks here, lots of folks elsewhere, and it's been said in several different ways. And I'm going to give you just one of them. And if this is the way you said it, I'm not picking on you. I don't remember who said it how. But know this. I wondered the same exact thing. I'm not casting stones or turning them into bread. What if I'm waited too late in my life for sonship to work for me? What if we don't have long enough? When you say that, you know what you're doing? you're limiting the power of the curriculum to do its job. It will do its job. It doesn't matter how late in life you start, you will be successful as a son. Don't confuse that with, I'm going to achieve one of those 24 seats in the... You will succeed as a son. It doesn't matter how late you start. It doesn't matter. You say, I, look, if, if we had only known this back, you know, 10 years ago, then I think it could work for me. This is going to work for you anyway. That's the power of this curriculum. Someone else would look and say, Paul had a whole different circumstance than me. He, he was in danger of his life. I had someone say to me, there's not going to be much reward for me because I live in a country where I'm not being thrown into prison for being a son and I'm certainly not being executed for being a son. Now maybe if you were in Iran or Iraq or Saudi Arabia, you might pay some kind of price, but I live in this country. So I'm not really paying that price like some missionary that's being thrown into prison and kept there for years. You have to understand this. I want to answer these objections. Because that when you go home with this question, that's what this has to ferret out. This is the question that answers those issues. So that you don't have a lingering doubt about what it will do. You are going to be presented with every single opportunity that you need to be successful and trained as a son. Now when I say you're going to be presented with every opportunity, I don't mean God is going to orchestrate some things especially for you. He's not intervening that way. But when you learn the sonship education, you are going to be able to put that education into practice in the everyday affairs of your life and God's going to make it so that you don't have to be thrown into jail in order to get the benefit of that education in you. Isn't that good? Otherwise, he would be saying to you, you're all going to jail. You're not. You may never... Paul gave his life. You may not. In fact, if things continue, you probably won't. And some of you are going... Thank God for that. But the curriculum will equip you that if you did have to, when that, when that trial came along, you will be able to bear it. Just as he did. That's what the curriculum will do. But you can't look and say, I, there's other people in circumstances that are far worse than mine. I guess I'm not going to get anything. You will. This thing is not going to fail. You're not going to be left, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Lacking something. 
Oh, if only somebody had beat me up for being a son. That's not it. You don't have to get a martyr complex over it. Believe me, plenty of stuff will happen anyway. But you, need, you just need to know this will work for you. Do, you. do you see what I'm saying? And this question is meant to take all of those things. Someone would say, well, look, I'm at home most of the day. I don't even run into that many people. I don't have the opportunity to other people. It doesn't matter. Whatever your situation is, your father can take the sonship curriculum and work it in your life and you will be a successful son or daughter of your heavenly father. And it doesn't matter what your circumstances are or I'm not smart enough or any of that kind of stuff, this curriculum is not going to fail and the guarantee is given to you when he says... He spared not his own son. There is no way he's going to go to that length and allow some little circumstance to stand in your way of succeeding as a son or daughter of your father and not being educated and getting up there and not knowing what to do. He is going to get that done for you. And that's what this is meant to produce in you. And we couldn't get away from this before I made you realize that you are not limited or you're not disadvantaged because you're not in someone else's shoes. I actually had a man that called me up and said, I, look, I don't see how you, you guys are getting this because over here we're not suffering at all for our faith. There's churches everywhere. And I thought, you, you don't understand. You're not suffering under the policy of evil at all. It doesn't even know you're on the planet. But that, the, whole, the whole objection was, you know, we're not suffering. I said, you, you, you underestimate the power of this curriculum to do what, it, what God said it would do. It will. It will be okay if you get to live a pretty good life and the things that you go through don't equate to sword. That'll be okay. All right. Now, that's really all I can say to you about this second question. But I want to make sure that we understand that the included in this question is we can't limit this curriculum. We cannot get to the place where we say that, that I've got a situation it won't handle. It will. Is there any question? If you've got a question about it, this is the time to raise it. And let me, let me help you. I got a question. Okay. Right. And that's what that did bother me a little bit about going into this sonship. I don't know if I can stay. Oh, you don't. Yeah, you don't need anything piling on top of what's already there. Yeah. I got you. Well, here's the good. Th here's the reason you would want to go into sonship, because not only does it equip you for that which you haven't encountered yet, it will equip you for those things which you are already having to endure because they're not part of the policy of evil, they're part of living in this world. And they'll equip you to do that. And that's really what you need uh, to be able to not have those things get you to the point where one more straw is going to break the camel's back. That, now, can I say that? That's a great question, because Clifford, that gives me the opportunity to say this. What you need to get you through that we don't have yet. You realize we're talking about something you're going to be given. Some of you are thinking, I've got my sonship life, but some things are giving me more problems than I think it should have. And to be honest, you don't even have the four skills yet. When you get those, you'll begin to put those to work in those kinds of areas and in other kinds of areas and they will begin to solve some of these issues. Right now, you just know they're out there, you know what they're going to do, and you'll be given a confidence to say, when you get them, they're going to do the job. But that doesn't give you any of those skills. 
You have to get them to be able to use them. And they're not, you're, you, there's really, in your sonship life, if you, and, and, and again, I'm not undoing what I said before, if, you, if we all die right now, no, your father knows at that point that the plane crashed into the building and wiped us all out. He knew that you had made the cry of Abba Father. He knew you were here to get this. He knew what you wanted. And you'll get up there as a successful son or daughter. You will be. And there's, a, there's more to it than that. There's actually a bump if you get cut short that you get in your sonship. Now we'll talk about that when we get over there. But... This is not, this is not, the, but, but you don't have everything that you're going to need yet. And you'll be like me. I, this was a confusing area for me. I kept thinking, this thing shouldn't be giving me this kind of problem if I'm a son. And I had to come to realize, I don't have any of the skills to deal with that yet. No wonder it's a problem for me. So the only thing I know now is, it's not going to be a problem for me. Now, if you're like me, then you're asking, what do I do in the meantime? <laughs> you just know this is coming. You just know this is coming. Okay. So, there we are. I've told you everything I can tell you about this. Now we're going to move into who verses. And we're going to start with the most common obstacle that you're ever going to face in all of your life and we're going to work our way back to the next most and then the third most and that's going to and every attack that comes against you is going to come from one of these three places the curriculum is going to deal with those and then we'll do a quick run through 9 10 and 11 and we'll start to get the sonship skills that we're going to need Karen Mm -hmm. as, as the months come through, and I, I'm, I'm kind of far behind now, but I've gone back and I've kind of sort of like the, what we're doing now with what you told us before. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of enlightening information that you're going to be giving us when you gave us the orientation. And it's really helped us give me some secret peace sometimes. Good. That, you know, because I know what, it's, what you've already talked about. Right. And now you're just, what is it, the milk and the milk? Yeah. Well, you know, I've had several people say that they've gone back to orientation and knowing what they know now, they'll say things like, you know, you said things back there, I heard you, I had no idea really what that was about, and now it's really clear. And that's not a bad thing to do, to go back and look at that. Right. Thank you. Thank you. That's really nice to hear. Okay. All right. Well, let's have prayer and we'll be done. And then read those next verses because that's where we'll take up when we come back next time. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. As we go home and think about this verse, if there's been an area that's been raised up today that really didn't come to our attention when we worked through this verse last time, if there was something hi hidden that... Uh, we didn't, didn't think about, and I pray that we'd bring that issue up and settle that issue with you, talk to you about it, understand exactly what this verse is saying to us, that it doesn't matter what it is. It could be something that's sitting out there in the future waiting for us to get there. It could be a, a, a circumstance that we find ourselves in, the situation we occupy in life. There there isn't anything that this curriculum is not going to enable us to handle it and to get the benefit that we're supposed to get from it and equip us to be successful sons. This curriculum has more power than we dare imagine. And I pray that as we move out of these first two questions and into the more specific questions, that these, these things that we've talked about will be put to rest in our mind and while we may not know exactly how that's going to be done, we'll wait for the curriculum to do that, knowing it will do its work. And we thank you, Lord, for the confidence that we can have in that. In Jesus' name, amen.